I want to talk to you about Carolina Hearn, who who was the the writer, the the the, the co-writer of of, of uh, the royal family, and Carolina Hearn. I I met Carolina Hearn before she was famous. I met her when I was auditioning. I was very very many decades ago. I was invited to audition for the Big Breakfast to be a co-presenter with Chris Evans, oh. and so I was over in, in in England, and I was in the queue of these girls that were auditioning, and ahead of me was Carolina Hearn, and she just entranced me. She had me in stitches. I was laughing walking into the audition. Yeah. She was talking about her Irish dad, who was telling her she saw that I was Irish saying, uh, you know, get a proper job. And I said, what are you doing, Caroline? She says, I'm doing funny voices on the radio. And uh, my dad is saying, you have to get out of this. You have to get a proper job. And she was just so funny. Oh, yeah. So she was hilarious. She was adorable. Uh, this is before she was famous. Was that the Caroline Ahern that, oh, that you knew? She was absolutely f fantastic. Very, but very naughty. <laughs> very naughty. I'm going to be telling a couple of her stories when I'm on... on, on do the, these little stage shows. Yeah. Well, one or two of them was a bit rude, but she is very funny. But we had, yet we used to have such a laugh. It was great. And, and but she was a perfectionist, you know. Mm. She was a perfectionist, and and people think like she was she was playing this dope, and she had an IQ of one seven four. She had mental IQ. Yeah, yeah. So I would she, absolutely believe that she. She was, was just sharp. So honestly, bright. yeah. She was sharp as a tack, and, and she was funny and. Um, and if she didn't, see, when, when she first wrote it, mm -hmm. the BBC weren't going to do it. Yeah. They said, no, it's, you know, ridiculous. Three people sitting in armchairs looking at the telly, they don't move out the room, no, no, no. So she said, well, I'm not, I'm not doing any more Mrs. Merton. Gosh. I'm not doing any more Mrs. Merton. And they Tough. went, well, hang on, hang on. Because yeah. they loved Mrs. Merton. Yes, yeah, yeah. And then, so they, they said, well, you know, we'll put on BBC Two. And that was it, and then obviously it went on BBC Two and, and took off. It was a it, massive it was, success. It was amazing. It was a massive success, and, and to this day, I mean, unfortunately she, she passed away. Yeah. It's very sad that she, she passed so early, but to this day, I mean, you're, 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 you're so loved as, oh, as, as Jim Royal. By her character, yeah. But, oh, but, but I mean, you're, the, the other night I, I looked again at Mike Bassett, England manager. I, it, it was hilarious as well. Like, it was just so, <laughs> so funny. Great was, scripting. But you know, I'll tell you, you know, something about direction. Mike, about Mike Bassett. Mm. There's two things. We have, have to keep doing the scene with Pelly. I've told the oh, lads, yeah. keep off the booze, keep off the booze. I'm the manager, keep off the booze. Then I'm on the bar, drunk as a lord, <laughs> yes. in my undies, doing all <laughs> this. And then Pelly had to come in and say something about, oh, where's the bloody English? And he couldn't do it for laughing. <laughs> really? He couldn't do it for laughing. <laughs> So we had to take, and he said to me, it's your fault, he said. He had to walk in and say, oh, typical English, and it. walk out. Yeah. I remember the scene. Well, well it, it took about ten takes for him to get it. <laughs> but what it did do, I was working with a fella called Phil Jackson, who was a lovely actor. Yeah. And Bradley Walsh was in it, and that was Bradley's yeah. first TV. So Ronnie Biggs was there, because okay. we were in, we were in the, um, Brazil, like. And I said, I'm going to go and see Ronnie Biggs. He wanted someone to play the barman in that scene. And uh, they were looking for an actress or something. I said, right, I'll go and get Ronnie Biggs. This, you need to set the, the, the scene for Ronnie Biggs now, who he is. Oh, Ron, Ronnie Biggs was one of the great train robbers. He yeah. got 40 odd years and he escaped. Yes. He escaped yeah. for years and, and, he, and he got off to South America and, uh, you know, and, to an incredible story. Anyway, he was living around there. We knew he was living around there. Yeah. So I, I said to Phil Jackson, I'm going to go up in the mountains and see if I can get hold of Ronnie Biggs and give him this work, just a little job in the movie. And because uh, we had our own, our own drivers and that, and who spoke Portuguese, and I said, "Have we got any idea where Ronnie Biggs is?" And he went, "I said, take us, you know." Yeah. So when he drives up in the mountains and goes into this little taverna, you know, little pub, and I walked in, I said, <laughs> <laughs> "Anyone seen Ronnie Biggs?" <laughs> <laughs> the place went, "Sure." <laughs> and they went, "No, senor, no, 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 no." no. <laughs> So we went back home, and I said, "I know there's some." I said, "I know that he's there." Yeah. I said to Phil, "We're going back tomorrow." He went, "Okay." <laughs> so I wrote a letter. I just said, <clears throat> "Dear Donny, listen, this is not a wind-up. Just a little day's work for you. I'd love to see you in this little movie. What we're doing and blah blah." Did blah. you know him from before? Did I know him? Yeah. No. 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 So I put put it in an envelope, and it goes back to the same pub. Yeah. But it didn't go quiet this time. So I just said, "Look, I'm looking for Donny Biggs, and this woman come out." Dressed in their finery, really, mm -hmm. she said. 
I believe you're looking for Ronnie Biggs. I said, I just want to get a message to him. She said, I'll get that message to him. She said, I promise you I'll give him this. So I went to give her a few quid to have a drink. <laughs> she went, no, no, no. no thanks. So we got up. The next thing is we didn't know. He was next door, apparently, leaving with newspaper reporters from the sun. Oh. When they brought, it, they brought him back to England, remember? Because yes. when he got out the, out, out the plane, he had the T-shirts on with the sun on. Yes. Well, missed him by minutes. <gasps> If I'd have gone the day before, I'd probably have got Would him have in got the him, movie. And it was only a day's work. And did you, did, was there follow-up then? Did you ever have contact with him? No, I never had contact with him. Now, yeah. No, no, Might no, no. Might very no. interesting. But I, but, I, but I remember the sentences them fellows got were ludicrous. Yeah. They got yeah. 40 years. Yes, yeah. And you know, what? I, I laugh sometimes to myself, you know, because the system t tells us all sorts of things, which is ludicrous. Like, there was a, fel a fellow once called George Blake who was a spy, a Russian spy, and they caught him, and they put him in jail in this country, and he escaped that night. How? How? How could you, if, if you put someone in this building that he'd never been in before, they wouldn't be able to get out. But they put <laughs> him in a top security prison, and he got out the same night. Mm. Ludicrous. Obviously, it's, a, like a, it's all a publicity stunt. They've probably exchanged him for someone with the right, Russians course, and whatever. Of course, But he was yeah. away, Blake, 40 years ago. 40 never, sp years. never spent an hour in jail. Gosh. Never spent a, have you never read about <laughs> it? You should get looked that up. George Blake, his name was. George Blake. It was round about um, Philby and, you, you know. Oh, yes, all yeah, around the spy, yes, yeah, yeah, you know. You have an incredible memory for... For, for little bits like but, that, but for, yeah. For people from, from decades ago as well, mm. in your youth and your teachers and your yeah, people that, yeah. that, that inspired you all along. Yeah, my teacher's name was Elwyn Jones. Mm. How Welsh is that? <laughs> and he, he encouraged me with the English, he said. He would say to me, Rick, when you get up and um, just describe that painting to me. And, you know, I'd do that. But he did an amazing thing, didn't he? Because didn't he tell you, describe that, that, that painting to somebody who can't see? No, to, to the class, it was to the class. Y yeah, but, but, but they can't see it, but you, so you have to use the words Oh, to, yeah, to, to but if he was going after class in, in a couple of schools, if the teacher was going out, they would, I would go out and tell them a story, just yeah. make a story of them. Yeah. On, on, and, and I still do it now with me, with me two grandkids. Isn't it funny how you're, you're, but you're, you're doing it on stage as well? You're yeah, be, I'm only telling a story. But I have, I have Jack. Jack is mm. the most beautiful looking kid you've ever seen in your life. This is your grandkids? He's, yeah, blonde. So he's here, and Maggie's here. Yeah. And I tell him this story, it doesn't matter what it is, and you can hear a pin drop. Yeah. And now and again I make a little mistake, and Maggie, like she's going on six, she elbows me and says, no, Grandad, I will say that, I was only testing you. Yeah. <laughs> I say, so, 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 so I tell them. <laughs> I keep them quiet for an hour yeah. or an hour and a half, tell them they need stories, and there's all sorts happen. Then when I finish, they run in the back kitchen and say, say to Rita, Grandad's been telling lies again. <laughs> <laughs> What was it? I think you were, you were in Brookside and you weren't released for a, a really major opportunity yeah. that came your way. What was that? Yeah, uh, uh, I, I just got into Brookside and I'm, I'm doing okay. And, I'm having a, and uh, Roland Joffey was making the mission, doing the mission. And, uh, Bobby often, De Niro. And, and, yeah, yeah. And, and, and Liam Neeson and, yes. and uh, yeah. Cheryl Lungi. And, yeah. and he offered me, a, and I couldn't do it because I was under contract to Brookside. And it meant going to South America for 14 weeks and I couldn't. So... But, you know, and I don't re I mean, I regret it in one way. I've had some fun with them. Yeah. But I loved Roland Joffe. I, I love him to this day. The guy with the feet up on the, on the, on the, oh, on yeah. the table. Oh, yeah. I yeah. went to stay with him in Chelsea. He lived yeah. in Chelsea. Yeah. And I went to stay with him. And uh, his, his house, he had, like, tapestries on the wall and the stained glass he'd, he'd got from a shop that was closing down and put stained glass windows in and... And I'm into all, I love all that. Where I get it from, I don't know. But behind his front door, the, the doorstop was a hand, a bronze hand. It was, it was breathtaking. It was like looking at your own hand. And I picked it up and I went, blinking. It looks as though there was a, a giant in the cellar. Gosh. Putting his hand through the door, you know, putting his hand through the ceiling. Yeah. I said, Roland, this is incredible. He said, oh, he said, my granddad made it. I said, he could make a fortune. They said, I said, he could make a nice few quid doing mm -hmm. that. He said, well... He does. His name's uh, to Jacob Epstein. <laughs> oh, so you, you have good taste. <laughs> you spot he this. Said, yeah, this he said, my granddad does that. His name's to Jacob Epstein. <laughs> he makes a few bob, like. <laughs> <laughs> a few bob. 
That's amazing. But he was great. Roland was great. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I want to ask you about um, the. I mean, you 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 obviously believe in in. in you've never forgotten your roots. No. You, you believe in giving back, and I think you gave a lot of money to a hospital. Um, you and your wife, yep. and and um, you're you're forever supporting, for instance, the Hillsborough, yeah. uh, the the Hillsborough victims, the, their families. You've been hugely, you know, supportive. I, I, I was I, I, I was in in Hillsborough, the movie Jimmy's movie, mm. um, but I, I didn't get in, involved with that because the, I think that was a very personal thing for the families. And they're well organised, and they do what they do. And I mean, I, w I went to a couple of little fundraisers early yeah. in the early days, but th but they're well they're well they're well supported, and they know what they're doing. And I just think that what they've been put through is horrendous. And it's oh, not resolved. Still. No, it's not resolved. Thirty yet. years later. And, yeah. and there's people there who, who are responsible. Will walk away from it. Who will walk away with it? And you know, people um, when they, they knew they were going to get charged, they resigned and on on the ground of ill health so they get their pensions and all like that which seems totally unfair when when you realize that them lads them 96 people and that they all lost their lives and how awful it was well you know there's th there's an analogy there and obviously you're a huge liverpool fan mm. sean cox the the, ah, the, the, yeah. the 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 man from family man from dunboyne and meath who also went like those people those 96 people went just to enjoy a match mm. and sadly outside uh, Anfield yeah. he, he was attacked by Roma fans and we we know that sentences have been recently passed one for the, the person that was the main perpetrator it was it was a sentence of three and a half years but um, I think at the end of the day there's there's a connection with the Liverpool fans the Irish people love yeah. Liverpool there's, j j j and I think Sean Cox is going to be so supported by oh, he will by be, fans, yeah. You know, he 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 will be, but you know, um, you know, you know, people laugh sometimes about the Irish jokes, and we have a lot of in common. But I I, I done a thing years and years ago for a little a little Irish lad li living in North Wales in Code Poet, mm. and he and he do, he done a little movie um, about. The Irish are always talking about going home, mm. and they only go home when they die. Mm. And there was, there was a, a, a firm of undertakers in Liverpool, and they lent us a hearse and a coffin, and you know, and they had it filmed going on the boat and, and doing all like that. And it, what was this young kid's name? He was only a young man, but he was doing a piece in the Irish Centre mm. in Liverpool. Yeah which is it's a shame because it was a beautiful building. In fact, I think they may be going to restore it. And it's a beautiful room, but round the, round the, the perimeter of the room is like eight or, eight or nine feet where there's no carpet, it's like wood. Yeah. And that's because an Irish horse always wins the national. And they used to bring it to the Irish centre and it would walk round the wood, <laughs> out the back door and down and onto the boat and back to Ireland, you see. That sounds very Irish. <laughs> yeah, honestly, uh, but I went in him one day, yeah. and I've got, I've got to say something. I've got to talk to the the barman who's pulling a pint of Guinness. So we're in one. This is one room. It's a big room, quite a big room. Yeah, honestly, yeah. I, I kid you not. <laughs> there was three you different the bands. But there was three different bands playing at the same time in the one room. Gosh. <laughs> You'd be singing Danny Boy. You walk across there, and you'll never go across the sea to Ireland. There. <laughs> And I couldn't believe it. I thought they're making it. They've done this for me. This can't be. <laughs> Three bands playing and, all and at the same time. <laughs> different stuff. Gosh. And and nobody going deaf. No, there. they're Eight all singing years. their own songs. Gosh. God, I couldn't believe it. Well, of course, this is the thing about the Liverpool fans as well. It's the music. It's, it's You know, when they sing, it's like somebody, some amazing director, choral director, has told them this is the note, this is the key. And it's just, it is amazing. It's like seeing birds doing the murmuring. Where it's did they learn it? It's amazing. It is really a phenomenal thing. On your, on your show, the, the Irish tour, uh, spring 2019, I think uh, we, we, you've got a marvellous um, uh, contributor there, Leroy James. He's, yeah. a, he's a comedian. He's he's also a singer songwriter. Yeah. And I think he wrote the. Liverpool he wrote Lampers, the anthem. He? He, he wrote the, the anthem, and it goes yeah. down really, really yeah. well. And yeah. he, he's performed it in front of the cop a few times for the families and friends, and yeah. that, you know. And uh, it, it, it's still as important today as it was all them years ago when they when they lost their lives. You know, it, I mean, it was dreadful. It, the, the incident itself is bad enough, but what the newspapers put in the paper about the fans. 
can never be forgiven. But I don't think they will ever be forgiven for that. No, they'll never it, be forgiven. It, it was they still don't buy that paper in newspaper. Yes, in Liverpool. no, no, they boycotted it. They but do I think not buy it. That uh, no. that, that, that and paper. it was years and years ago, as you mm. know, with the It was cruel. awful. It was absolutely yeah. cruel. You so know. Um, I want to say to you, uh, or I wanted to mention to you as well about um, to speak of the way you give back. You also raised funds for. You had a quadruple bypass. Yeah. I think in 2007. Yeah. And you raised funds for the, the hospital. About 20 grand, I think, we raised. Yeah, on that. We'd, yeah. We'd just done a one night, we'd done a show on a one night, and everyone on the show had, had, a, had, a, had a heart job, so we called it the zipper show. <laughs> because you, you, you have, see, you take the vein from yeah. there, you see? Yes, I see. And you'd have that white mark there, but you can see yeah. where they've stitched you together. Yes, yeah. So we called it the zipper show. So everyone was on, like, the, you know, the Grumbleweeds and Johnny Casson and all them. And uh, everyone wanted to be on the show because it was a sellout at the Empire yes. Theatre. Yeah. It was a sellout. And this you were the compare? Oh, yeah, I compared yeah, it. Yeah. And this woman phoned me up. She said, Rick, her husband's a comedian, you know, and he's a good comedian. Mm. She said, Is there any chance of um, Denny being on the show? And I went, has, has he had a bypass or anything? She said, No, but I've got a touch of angina. <laughs> She's looking for any connection. <laughs> but this, this show was fabulous. And you raised, as you say, 20,000. And I think um, when you went into the hospital, probably because of your socialist mm -hmm. uh, uh, um, tendencies and, 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 yeah. and, you know, your passion for socialism, um, you decided to go public. You didn't go as a private patient. You went as oh, a Oh, no. Well, what, ha what happened is... Um, I, I went as an ordinary patient, yeah, mm. you, just, uh, you know, and, and, and done all that. Yeah. And um, I, I was telling these people on, at the, um, up in Durham on, on Sunday, I had to go private oh, about six months ago, and I went, I couldn't walk. I mean, not at all. Couldn't walk. The doctors were, our doctors were brilliant, and they said, Rick, we haven't got a clue. But I couldn't get out of bed, I'd cry, I couldn't put my feet on the floor. It was awful, so Rita said to me, and Rita's a lefty, she said, you're going to have to go private and see if they can do something. And I went, mm. no, I said, I can't. I said, I said, you know my feelings about private medicine. She said, Rick, the nearest appointment I can get you is nine weeks. For nine, that's just for an appointment. Anyway, I had to say, all right. So I said, all right, I'll just go and, and so you know, to, to go and see these specialists, what it costs. Yeah. It ended up a fortune. three. Three specialists, one for me knee, one for me calf, one for my ankle, didn't have a clue. Two MRI scans, £500 ago, mm. didn't have a clue. An ultrasound scan on my ankle, didn't have a clue. I'm still in the same pain and I'm up. Oh. And my mate, he's fabulous. He raises more money than anyone I've ever met. And he's just an ordinary fella knocking out. He said, go and see my mate, he said. He said he's the physiotherapist for Sammy Rovers Football Club. I said, Jimmy, I've just been spent three thousand yeah, pounds yeah. with these top jolly men, mm. machines, MRI scans, ultrasounds. He said, Well, it's worth a try, Rick. So I went to this fellow. He said, They just leave your shorts on, Rick. Get on the table, put your head there. And he started off he, just a massage, mm. twenty acupuncture needles, forty minutes under this uh, heat lamp, and I walked out and went on that walking holiday. Gosh. Thirty quid. Oh my God! Thirty quid. I've no idea how many people are going to identify with that, with yeah. what you just said there. Yeah. And spending fortunes on. Medical but what I've done, I've put everyone onto this guy. He's smashing. He's he's got a look, and he he's one of his daughters is trained, so he, he does all the all the men, and his daughters do do any 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 women. Yeah. But he's amazing. It was I couldn't believe it when I got off, because when I got off the desk, I went off the, the bench, I went because I couldn't put my foot on the floor. Yeah. But at country. the same time, it should be available for anyone, not it's because you've got a few quid. Absolutely, absolutely. Not because you've got a few quid. I don't believe no. in queue jumping and all that. I really don't. But you, you might even get better treatment as a public patient. I think was your point. Well, before, listen, wasn't I did it? with the with the bypass. Yes, yeah. Because what happened is they were putting stents in. Yeah. And you're watching it. You're watching the stents. Yeah. And he went, "This is not going to work, Rick." He took them out or whatever he done. He said, "You'll have to go and have your uh, you got, you'll have to go and have open heart surgery." Yeah. And so when I went to the hospital two weeks later for the open, I went up to the receptionist at um, Broad Green Hospital and uh, I gave the girl my name 
and I said, you know, Ricky Thomas, and she said, uh, who's your doctor? I said, no, I'm, I, that's what I want to find out. She said, I've just told you, who? That's his name, Doctor Who. Oh. <laughs> doctor Who was your doctor? That was his name. No. He was a Burmese, a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful man. His, his first name is Ang, A-N-G. Yes. And it, his, his second name is spelled capital O, small O. Mr. Who. Who. I call him <laughs> Dr. Who. Rita goes nuts and says, you must call him Mr. Who. <laughs> this is the, 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 the hospital that you raised the 20,000 for. To thank yeah, after, 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 yeah, after, after these that, honors, yeah. After that. But he was, he was absolutely it's wonderful. He, he, he was absolutely wonderful. And then we've done another little thing. I think I'm called the Superland Bananas. I don't know whether you ever had them here. No. Like, it's shaped like a sheep, but it's a banana. And there's statues to them all over, big statues to them. But there was also these lovely little porcelain ones. Yeah. And I got a load and took them to the hospital. I just forget what we charged yeah. for them. But well, we made them a nice few hundred quid, well, a few, more than a few hundred quid. Made yeah. them a few quid for that. So I want to ask you a question before, before we, we wrap things up, um, Ricky. It, it's, it, it's about your career, I suppose. You're very, very very successful career despite the mm. adversity you had yeah. and the resilience you showed and that you've had all along um it's a very successful career you've had a lot of fin financial prosperity as yeah. well um is money important to you no not at all not at all it really like w me and jimmy jimmy king i was talking about before there was a little girl from birkenhead and she had some dreadful disease i don't know what it was she was only a toddler and she had to go to mexico for the treatments and the treatment was the bill was that that much, and so we done a few bits. We got Charlie Lansbury, we put him on the theatre at um, over over on the Whittle where they live. And we, I think, on that afternoon, we we, we raised about nine thousand on that day, and then we done a few other little things and sent it. She went off to Mexico, and she was responding, and then all of a all of a sudden she just died. She just a little and packed in, and someone said, "Well, was it worth it?" I said, "Of course it was mm. worth it. Of course it was worth it." You know, a parents had her for a little bit longer. She was a lovely little they girl. They had her for longer, but also they knew that you cared. Uh, yeah, yeah. You know. Uh, uh, absolute, absolutely. I mean, I, I get letters all the time. I mean, sometimes you can't keep up with them, you know. But yeah, I mean, yeah. with me and this Jimmy, we, we've done all sorts. We've paid for all sorts of little things. That, like headstones for toddlers' graves and stuff like that, you know. Mm. And and he, he's, my, he's, he's just an ordinary guy, but he's got... You know, he'll bully people into, we've got a show on here, you come do 20 minutes, Rick's comparing and do that. And that's what we do, we have the raffle and we have this, a collection, we have a little bingo or whatever, and then he just does whatever he wants with it. And uh, But no, he's, he's helped a lot of people out. But you know, I, when I was up in the, uh, up, up at uh, Geordieland at the weekend, do you know what I'd done? I was opening a food bank, mm. a food bank, and I said, I'm very, very proud to be doing this, mm. but I'm disgusted that I'm having to do it. I know. This day and age, and a food bank, you know. And I remember, I, I was opening one, I was doing, serving in one a few months ago with Len McCluskey. And it was a rain, it was a Saturday morning, it was raining, we were in a church. We were giving these bags of food out to people, and a fella came in and he looked at me, and he went crimson, because I knew him, he was a joiner. And he went, Rick, I said, what? Don't be worrying about that. He said, Rick, I'm working. Hmm. I'm working, but I can't live. I've got, and he had a few kids. And I said, well, don't, I said, just go and get what you need. Go and take what you need. Don't be worrying about it. And I thought, that's awful. He was so embarrassed. Oh, but that's, that's so common here as well. I mean, despite the fact that we're supposed to be, in Ireland, we, full, at, full unemploy, at, at full employment, you know, the employment figures are, 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 are so good. Uh, there are 10,000 people who are homeless, and three th over 3,000 of them are children living in emergency accommodation. There's just something wrong with this picture. So, absolutely. Yeah. It's crackers. It's like people sleeping rough. It's um, a lot of them are, are, are ex servicemen, aren't they? A lot of them are ex servicemen, and um, I recently got a call off this Jim Nichol. He's the lawyer, like, and he, he was talking about people living in the, in the, uh, the jungle in mm. Cali. And uh, he, he wanted thirty pound a, a coat to buy a coat for him, so uh, I sent him a couple of grand. And then, but but what I did do, a mate of mine got a factory, and he takes these kids in the skateboards and bikes and all that, and they have these fleeces, you know, mm. 
And I, I said to Colin, have, have a word with the lads. Anyway, they gave me these bundles, these bundles of fleeces, which we sent. They paid for them to be sent to Calais, yeah, yeah. to the jungle. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, give, give, give us some as well. So I took them to the Florence Institute because they've got a homeless football team. So they all got one. And then this young fella, I don't know who he was, he was in the club. He filled his car with them at midnight and went round. And anyone sleeping rough in Liverpool that night, he gave them a woolly fleece. Just, I thought, how nice is that, a young man? Yeah, yeah. He's taking a chance because, you know, sometimes you can come on stock, can't you? Some of them can rear up on you, you know, because some of them are not mentally well. Mm. And, uh, but there's a lot of good people around, you know, there's a lot of people who, you know. A lot of people that just slip through the cracks. Mm -hmm. People that are from good backgrounds. Yeah. They can still end up homeless. Yeah. Oh, and and th those are the figures that we know about, both in the UK and in Ireland, that, you know, they, they don't account for the people that are living on couches or on know. people's floors but yeah. you know i think it's it's probably appropriate to 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 wind up at this yeah. stage and just to say that um i think we'll end with your friend jimmy mcgovern the cracker oh, writer yeah. and the wonderful wonderful uh wonderful writer one, and, and a good friend of yours yeah he is um because he said about you uh ricky he said i love ricky he said it's not for his looks <laughs> <laughs> How dare he? How dare he? <laughs> he said, it's not for his talent, huge as it is. It's for this, his incredible humanity. He's lovely, Henry Gooden. I've got a wonderful photograph of me and him sitting on a sh chaise lounge somewhere, and we're both doubled up, doubled up laughing. And I would love to know what we're laughing at. <laughs> I would love to know what we're laughing at um, but you know he goes to the match with colin McEwen. colin McEwen's got a film company called la productions and jimmy does all the writing moving on and all that you know yeah, yeah. and um now and again they invite me to go because i'm not I, I love to I liverpool and support them but i'm an armchair supporter but now and again i go with them yes yeah and it doesn't matter if liverpool's winning one nil <laughs> two nil or ten nil jimmy says pack of shit pack of <laughs> shit <laughs> So now when I'm at home, it doesn't matter what score Liverpool are winning, when I just text. <laughs> yeah. You saw Everton and uh, Liverpool. Liverpool at door. Yeah, My nerves were gone. <laughs> Absolutely. My nerves were gone. I settled for the draw in the end. Love Klopp, Klopp though. Love oh, Klopp. he's wonderful, he's isn't he? Yeah. He's, yeah. he's a crack. I talk, about him, I talk about the Klopp effect. I don't know if there's such a thing. As, but just this positivity, this thing that trickles down. The players are playing like 14-year-olds who have discovered their passion for football again. They're not these multi-million uh, pound earning no. footballers. They're, they're a team and they're loving it and they're enjoying yeah, it. Yeah. But we'd like, to, we'd like them to get a better result in the next, oh, uh, but you in know, the next me, nine me, games. But, you know, my mum used to work at Everton's and Liverpool's. That's another, another of her jobs. And she used to, yeah, yeah. She, blimey, she worked till she was 80-something or nearly. You know, she died when she was 86. But she worked there and she, doing the meals for the players. Yeah. And if, if they were going off... Then they used to get a, a carry out to take with them and whatever, you know. And she said Bill Shankly was unbelievable. He knew every he knew them all by their first name. Yeah. Be, my, my mum would be Peg and so and so and so and so and so and so. And even the fella on the gate who opened the gate for the footballers to drive their fancy cars in, Shankly knew everyone yeah. like that. Yeah, yeah. And um, I mean, he he, he was a, a one-off character. But there's a famous footballer in Liverpool. He's re he still plays now, actually. He might be at that match. At there's name's a Legends match coming legend. up on, well, the, on the 12th of April. He might be Fort there. Cox, yeah. it, this fellow's name's Alan Kennedy. All oh, right. Now, Alan, Alan is a bit of a lad. He sounds Irish <laughs> with a name like he's that. He's a bit of a lad and he's a bit of a rough, <laughs> rough and tumble merchant. And Bob Paisley, when Bob was manager, was yeah. always getting him out of trouble. He'd say to him, <laughs> Alan, behave yourself. Do this, do that. But he'd go back, he'd be fighting off the pitch and all that. Yeah, nonsense. yeah, yeah. Anyway, he comes to this important game, mm. and Bob Paisley said, now listen, Alan, Alan Kennedy said, you can make your name here today, he said, I want you to mark so-and-so. Keep him wide, keep him on the wing, don't let him... Anyway, Kennedy went out and had a few drinks. <laughs> on the Saturday, this fella run rings round him and scored the winner or something. <laughs> so Kennedy was going to try and slip away, and he, yeah. one of the lads came up and said, the boss is waiting for you in there. Paisley's waiting for you. He said, don't go, you've got to go and see him. <laughs> so Kennedy walked up to him with his tail between his legs and mm. Paisley just looked at him and said, they shot the wrong Kennedy. Oh. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> but that, that took the sting out of it. <laughs> they were all laughing after that. <laughs> That's very funny. But uh, he, he's, he's lovely when you bump into Kennedy, Alan Kennedy. <laughs> I've got a lovely photo, I've got a lovely drawing, like a caricature of him and a, a, a distant little mad fella called Gary Skyner. Mm. It's great, I don't know who done it, but it's, it's huge. But he's lovely, that can. And all of them lads, or most of them ex players, they do their little bit for charity. Yeah, you know they'll yeah. they'll go and do yeah. whatever they've got well, to they're, do. Well, they're great to, to support Sean Cox. I mean, oh, very no. appreciated. And I think it's a it's a Liverpool thing though too, and it's a Liverpool. But I, I think it should. Thing, I think it, it should spread further than Liverpool. I think other, other yeah. surely other teams, if they know, should send a few quid. Yes. You know, it doesn't matter that it was a Liverpool game. It could have been an Everton game. Well, I game think Ro was. Roma have, have made some contributions. I think, I think they, they have, some, yeah. Some contributions. Yeah. I know I said finally about 10 minutes ago, but I'd like to ask you, will you tell us one of the stories that you're going to tell at your concerts in Ireland? Just um, a little preview. I'll just tell I, I, I love some of the famous people that I've, that I've met and worked with. And um, I think one, one, of, one of my favourites was uh, Norman Collier. Now, these young lads might know Norman Collier. Well, he was a very famous comic. Do you know Norman Collier? I, I'm he used pretending to, to be young here. He's, he's, when, he gets <laughs> the mi when he gets the microphone, he goes... By the mic, by the way, the mic's pro. Testing, testing. And then this, he was doing this club, and the fella come up and changed the mic, you see. <laughs> and he went... T -t 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 -t. The fella brought him another one, because it's part of his act. Yeah. But Norman is wonderful. He's a yeah. wonderful old-fashioned comic. He was on the comedians and everything. Anyway, he's a, he was a great comic. <laughs> he's in hospital having his hair, uh, he had a hernia operation. So he's in like a little ward. It's not a proper ward, just the curtains round. Because he was in his mid 80s. Mm. And he's with half a dozen other fellas all the same age. And the specialist come down, he said, Norman, can I have a word? So he said, what is it? He said, Mr. Collier, do not make the other patients laugh anymore. <laughs> I'm sick and tired of redoing the stitches. <laughs> so Norman, Norman got a cob on and put his dressing gown on over his pyjamas and he stood just outside the curtain. There's a great big, a great big corridor. Yeah. And there's an old chap coming down like that. And he's got a drip stand on wheels. But on the drip stand is a huge <laughs> saline bag. Yeah. And Norman watched him for about 20 minutes till he got level with him and he went, All right, Albert, I see your goldfish has died. <laughs> <laughs> and the stitches burst again. <laughs> That's probably where uh, you were in stitches laughing. I mean, honestly, comes from. God. And speaking of Norman, you, you, you knew Norman Wisdom as well. Oh, very, very well. Yeah. He was so funny. He was wonderful. I would put him with, like, Eric and Ernie. Oh, that yeah, absolutely. Of, yeah, yeah. And a tough kooky, by the way. Was he really? Oh, he was. was he? But I'd done all his own stunts. There was no stuntman. All them where he comes down the staircase, down the banister on the thing and goes through the window. Done it all out himself. And he had a terrible life. A really terrible... His, his autobiography is tremendous. It's called My Turn Next. And he, so he'd run away from home because his mum, his father was, wasn't very nice with him. Mm. And he joined the army when he was 14. And uh, for three years he was army boxing champion at flyweight, you know, because he was only a little fella. Yeah. He, he was, uh, and then he, wanted, he had a brother and he wanted to try and find his brother and he, as he was, when he was getting older. And uh, he had a motorbike. So he decided to drive one Sunday to Brighton to see if he can find his brother. But when he gets there, it's teeming down. It's, shattering down and there's no one about and he spots this fella looking at the shop window window dressing and he t and he drove up to him and said excuse me can you tell me and it was his brother it was his brother isn't that amazing he didn't recognize yeah him. well he didn't how long was him. it since he had seen him must have been years but then they obviously Gosh. got you know what he got yeah but he, he um he, he, he went to live in Spain, uh, at the Isle of Man, wasn't it? Was it the Isle of Man and had it, like a hacienda built and stuff yes, like that? Yeah, yeah. But he was a great character. He I was very, him. very funny. I loved him. And there are other comedians nowadays that, that seem to try and really copy him. But, but, and uh, but there's a lot of good ones. Bruce you know. Forsyth's very talented. Oh, but he was so talented. Yeah, very I mean, the, the, the dancing and the thing. I actually saw him, this is showing my age as well, uh, at the Palladium 
in London. Oh, no, 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 I, I saw no, Bruce not that Forsyth. old. I, <laughs> Bruce Forsyth. I saw when he was married to Anthea Redfern and do give us a twirl. Oh yeah, Anthea. Yeah, yeah, bloody yeah. I mean, those, those were great days too. That, that, that you know, going back and, and Bob Monkhouse and all the quiz shows and. Have you read his book? I haven't. It's called but I'd Crying, love to. Crying with Laughter. It's um, it's unbelievable. Yeah. Yeah. Unbelievable. Yeah. His little fling with dying the doors and all that. And oh, all that. really? Oh, was a, oh. He was a boy. Are and these a half. the kind of stories you're going to be telling? No, I won't be telling the them. I'll just be telling them everyone I've worked with. <laughs> I've worked with Norman. I've worked with, you yeah, know, yeah. Norman Wisdom. Yeah. I'll just tell them stories about them. Yeah. For them, no, the book is fantastic. Really? And so is yours, Ricky. Uh, it's, yeah, it's, yeah if, they've if, done if, all right. Yeah. If our listeners haven't uh, read it, it's, it's, it's wonderful. Because it's um, sometimes you get a you know an autobiography, as written by a well-known person, yeah. who it might be ghost-written or it might be written by them. But this is a, a book written by a writer. What? It's warts and so all, isn't it? It's warts and it's, all, it, and, and it, that's it's and compelling that's it. reading. But listen, yeah. you've been wonderful. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Pleasure for coming in and pleasure, kid. Lovely. It. Thank you. Thank Super you. duper. You two that'll cost you a pound each. <laughs> What about him? <laughs> no, he's working. <laughs> he's, he's working. <laughs>